good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to this webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about why Taboola switched from Oracle to Azul Java. And just a couple of housekeeping things before we get going. Um, the first is that we are recording this webinar. So if you're interested in watching it again, if you're interested in sharing it with your friends, with your family, then you'll receive a link to this at the end of the, uh, shortly after the webinar finishes. We'll also send you a copy of the slides. And in case you have questions, then please feel free to add those to the Q&A section on the webinar software. And what we'll do is we'll go through the, the slides and then at the end, we'll address the questions um, that people have. So my name is Simon Ritter. I work as the Deputy CTO of Azul Systems, and I'm joined today by Ariel Pizetsky, who is the VP IT at Taboola. And I'll let Ariel introduce himself and start talking about Taboola. Thank you very much, Simon. So yes, I'm Ariel, I'm with Taboola, and I would like to start with talking a bit about Taboola and then talk a lot about what we do with uh, with Azul, specifically with Zing, and why it, was, why it was helpful for us. So just a bit about Taboola. Taboola is a content discovery platform. We are that company that helps you find content that you may like and you never knew is out there. When you browse or surf the web and you are at the bottom of an article or maybe midsection, maybe on the right rail, and you see those boxes of content that you may like, that is us. And we really help people discover interesting and new things at the moment when they are engaged, what we like to call those moments of moments of next, when you are leaning in, when you are looking at your screen, you are consuming content and you wish to read the next article, the next interesting thing, the next thing that is relevant for you. And I've, I've said for you twice now, and the main driver for that is really the personalization. Every recommendation that we provide is personalized. That means that if Simon and I were to browse the same page of the same publisher, we would not actually be seeing the same recommendations. The recommendations for Simon, the recommendations for me would be different. Now we do this on multiple digital properties places that you've seen online, places that you have seen, and um, to the extent that we now provide anywhere between two to three to four billion web pages a day, depending on the day, depending on the news. Um, obviously, in the time of COVID, for example, we saw a huge surge over the first month during March and a bit into April, where every, every one of us was online consuming content looking for more news, trying to understand what is happening around us, how the world has changed. From then, that number has now declined back to normal, I'd say, uh, browsing kind of activities. But still, it is really interesting to see how those numbers ebb and flow and how we provide that moment of next to every one of you. Generally speaking about numbers, we see in our discovery 1.4 billion unique users every month. We see about 1.5, or we actually serve 1.5 billion clicks, which means that beyond those billions of recommendations that we provide every day, people also, of course, click on those recommendations. And we need to now serve that recommendation and provide all the back end of that click, which as a Atom kind of operation would seem very benign, but at scale is actually quite a big challenge. Um, in terms of kind of compute, you would see that on average 3.2 billion a day, 30 billion recommendations, 8,500 physical servers worldwide. Uh, we reach 1.4 million queries per second on our system at, uh, at fully aggregated load. So, if we look at the amount of just requests coming in at peak, that is a interesting number. And of course, the lines of logs. For every recommendation, we will have a line of log. For every server, we will have metrics. We will have a lot of data that we need to pull in. And we will have a lot of different events that have different significance 
for different people within the organization. And so, so without further ado, that's big data, isn't it? That is that is big data in terms of um, variety, in terms of uh, volume, and in terms of um, I'd say the velocity of of it coming in. And if you are kind of looking at what we did, and this is the immediate first graph to immediately understand how Zing impacted us. So maybe before I talk about this graph for a second, I'll just say that we are a Java shop. Uh, our application is Java-based. Our Cassandra database is Java-based. We have other applications that are Java-based. And we have multiple different uh, companies that have merged into Taboola with the years that are also Java-based. So we see a whole lot of impact every time we can optimize anything on the specific Java platform. And here, this is like a plain vanilla Cassandra. This is a community version Cassandra, real graph, real data from Taboola, from our clusters. And this is like the first view where you can see that point in time where we had a, enough of Zing installed on our Cassandra servers where we moved from a higher level of the latency to a lower la level of latency in all of the measurements, not only in the P50, but as you can see here in the red line, the P99. So it's really amazing to see how we could improve the runtime of the application by actually touching the Cassandra. So the Cassandra now on really hundreds of servers is not served with the plain old JVM, but with the Azul Zing JVM, saving us on latency and allowing us to, to better serve our clients. And a, a, so, a wonderful thing, yeah? So, so I, 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 I won't stop you, so I, I'll jump in after you finish that bit, <laughs> sorry. Okay, a wonderful thing that you can see here is the flattening of the averages and even of the P95. I mean, the P99 is still very noisy. The red line here you can see is still very noisy. But the blue line, the P95, you can see is like totally flat. So 95% of the requests coming into this Cassandra database have actually been totally flattened. And this, of course, is due to the job, the, I'm sorry, the garbage collection being handled properly via the Azul software. And yes, Simon, you were you were what you wanted to say. Yeah, so I was just gonna add a little bit of detail there because clearly, um, as you say, what's happening there is that the garbage collection which was interfering with what was happening from the cassandra cluster and actually being able to deliver the results that you're looking for what we do with zing is to essentially eliminate the garbage collection pauses by doing it concurrently with the application threads and that that's a really big difference because we're running the garbage collection simultaneously with the application so you're able to handle the the, the queries you're able to return the results whilst we're doing the garbage collection in the background and, and the way that we do that is by using a read barrier so that in terms of um, every time you access an object what we can do is we can ensure that you can do that safely so if we're doing marking we always make sure we mark the object before we give it to you if we're actually moving objects around within the heap which we actually we do again concurrently with the application we do it totally safely so you can make any changes to those objects and then when you we give them to you to use then you can make any changes completely safely so that that's really the big thing there it's all 100 percent safe and it gives you that uh, elimination of, of the latency in the way that you're seeing in that particular graph so i would even use another maybe very obvious to you simon but for us it, when i first heard of azul it was not obvious drop replacement mm -hmm. it was as easy as that it, we just we didn't have to think about this. We didn't have to do anything in our code. We didn't have to do anything in our application. And this is Cassandra. We didn't obviously touch Cassandra. We just replaced the JVM and it worked. Yeah, that, that is a nice point, actually. The fact that you can just drop in the JVM. You don't have to change any of your code. There's no recompilation, no recoding to make take advantage of these features and even to the point where you don't have to change any of your startup scripts you don't have to change any of the parameters that you set um, we make it really really easy from the the tuning point of view because um, if you wanted to go in and, and actually do any tuning essentially what you start with is just changing the size of the heap and that's that's really all you have to do so all those command line flags that you would typically use with other JVMs those are not required for Zulu for, sorry for Zing um, and so you can 
you can use the same startup scripts because any of the ones that we don't support, we just ignore. So it doesn't cause any problems. Yes. And I'll go into the next graph. And this is the metrics as seen from a single Cassandra node. It's the same kind of graph that you saw, you saw earlier, but this time, if the former graph, this is from the kind of uh, application view, and that's why the whole um, top is smudged there because it's an internal application. If we go to this um, internal graph, you see that this is the Cassandra metrics, and I just smudged the, the name of the data set, but you see here that it totally flattened out. So if we had up to 1.5 seconds, when we're talking about milliseconds, the need for milliseconds of operations on the uh, 99 percentile, we now see a total kind of uh, flattening of that line. And this is on the Cassandra side as well. So it's the application sees a healthier status and the Cassandra itself sees a healthier status. And this wonderful graph, or multiple graphs, this is from the Zing uh, proof of concept that we ran in uh, Taboola when we started out with the um, with with Azul. And this is again a, a few years old. We're, we're going to get newer graphs in a moment, but uh, I wanted to bring you to the kind of beginning of where we where we started. And you see the the nice trend from left to right. You see that drop line from left to to right. So if I specifically um, direct you to graph number four on the bottom left side, you see on graph number four that you have the green line that is going from top left to bottom right, and that is read timeouts. So the cluster actually had about 15 to 13% timeouts for the application. It wasn't answering fast enough within the time budget that my application needed. And this again is an application view. This is not a Cassandra metric, this is an application metric. And you can see how it totally flattened out on the uh, right bottom right side of graph number four. And the interesting thing here is why, why do we have this trend over time? Because over these few days in December, what we did is we took and upgraded one, two, three, or five nodes per day, because again, this was just a, knowing what we know today, we would just drop it on all of them at once and that's it. But this was our proof of concept and we, we kind of upgraded our cluster over time. So the more nodes received the Zing package, the better the timeouts were for that node. And then in average over the full cluster, if this is a 60 server cluster, and think of the fact that I have 60 servers in each cluster times six for all of my data centers globally, then this is a whole lot of, of servers globally that I have to upgrade. And you can just see that wonderful trend. And then eventually around the end of December, uh, you see this flat line. And think of this as December, it's the peak time for advertisers, for publishers. And with all that going on uh, up, into, up into Christmas, the, the Zing proof of concept was just proving itself to be so amazing. Uh, you can see on the other graphs, the same type of improvement on the top you can see the cassandra metrics on uh, graph number two and on graph number three you can see also the request latency go down there on the p999 yes simon i'm sorry i was uh, no 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 i was, I was just going to say i think that it's interesting easy because I, I you took the approach that i think everybody would take which is to go okay let's you know just do it gradually because we don't want to like put all our eggs in one basket and suddenly change everything and find that things don't work quite the way that we want them to. But I'm assuming that you didn't find any problems in terms of functionality changing. So everything just ran exactly the same as it did when you used the old JVM, switch to Zing and everything's just doing exactly what it was doing before. It just now does it faster and doesn't have the, the, yep. the read timeouts and things, which is exactly what you're looking for. And yeah, as I you could clearly see that the, the right approach was to do it gradually, but it's nice to see that that sort of gradual approach, and then suddenly, boom, you've got everything running there, and the, it just flat lines at the bottom. Absolutely, and and it flat lines in a good way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, now these these are of course much. Uh, these are from two weeks ago. Uh, we had another another application, internal application that was yet to run on Zing, and the R and D team there was going why like why why not us and i said guys you want it you can have it uh, test it see see what it does for you so this is already using um on the on the version 
on the on the 20s i mean this year's version and this is uh, as i said two weeks uh, two weeks old graph and you can see here that this is the internal application um, from a different uh, proof of concept this time and you can see just the cpu consumption so you're looking at the same application two identical servers in terms of hardware and you see the yellow line is or the yellow yellowed out line is the um is the zing server and the green area is the nosing server and you see the really big differences in cpu only with this difference just looking at this before we go into the rest of the graphs you can see that i can save on the amounts of servers because my server count is and or actually my let's call it it footprint has a huge impact on my hosting costs my running costs and my ability to serve recommendations again let's go into those really big big numbers when you provide three billion web pages a day you need a whole lot of servers the less servers you have the better the economics work yes i uh, I was going to say, I think this is also a very interesting graph from the point of view of showing that um, because we do garbage collection concurrently with application threads, some people think that the problem might be, well, okay, now, now you're actually placing a heavy load on the system. And so you're going to degrade the amount of throughput that you get with the application because now you're doing garbage collection work at the same time. And then the way we get around that is because we've actually changed the JIT compiler as well. Um, so we use a, a JIT compiler called Falcon rather than C2 that you get in uh, the standard open JDK software. And that enables us to sort of um, compensate for the fact that we're doing garbage collection simultaneously and still get the performance so that as you can see here you're you're delivering lower cpu utilization with that low latency as well so it's kind of a win-win yes and the next graph is the timeouts so there weren't a lot of timeouts you see this is 0 0.1 percent but only one server has out of the two has timeouts uh you see only one spike very small spike here and very small spike here but only one server has these timeouts and that's the not zing server so we, we kept the same color scheme so if you look this is this is the same time frame so if we're looking between 2200 and midnight mm -hmm. and again between 2200 and midnight we see the the kind of peaks of timeouts and we see that the lower the cpu was the less timeouts we saw on the server but the Zing server had no timeouts at all. Looking at the next graph, I'm sorry. I just, I, I just just make one comment on that, which is that where you did see one one spike there. And sometimes yep. there are things that we can't account for, which is that the underlying operating system, there might be some scheduling things or you know timeouts that happen um, around um, the hardware or, or something like that. So although I'm not claiming that that's exactly what it is, but often there are things that we can't compensate for. So we can actually get a, a, a flat line, but sometimes we see um, artifacts of the fact that by eliminating the garbage collection pauses, what you're now seeing is other underlying things. So just, just a Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you look at the, at the space under the graph, the total amount of requests that timed out, one spike here and a tiny spike there, compared to constant timeouts isn't even comparable. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, I personally, we didn't wor worry about that. And then this um, here is a bit of a different coloring scheme because this is a view from the load balancer. So I'm sorry we changed the, the coloring scheme. So it maybe is a bit harder to follow, but you see the purple line is the Zing server. And you see again, the two short um, kind of spikes of, of 500s. But if you look at the, non-zing server you see it's it's showing 500 so if you see, take but, again these two yes i was gonna say when i saw that graph i didn't even realize there was a second line on there <laughs> yes it's it's almost it's totally flat lined except these two little spikes here so the the the, the little two spikes that that are approximately 3 a.m and and between uh, 2200 and 2300 and if you're looking at the the red line again you see that we're constantly reaching over two percent of upstream errors which means that two percent here and then the timeouts that were in the former graph all that put together shows me that this server which is identical hardware identical amount of load is getting me less uh, results it's manufacturing less recommendations and that is very critical for me 
Uh, looking at busy threads, this is a, another interesting view, and again, corresponds same colors as before, same timeline, uh, corresponds to the zing and not zing, and you see the busy threads spike up on the uh, non-zing server. A yeah. nice graph here. I'm sorry, you want me to? So, no, sorry, I, I, I'm just thinking that, that that kind of ties in with exactly what we've seen with the other graph. So it's, it's a nice proof of the way that Zing works in terms of eliminating the, uh, the issues that you were seeing. Yes, and now looking at the, at the time, at the 99th percentile, and this is the net time that the requests are, are, are taking, then you see here that on the 99th percentile, the Zing server is still providing lower CPU. We saw that in the former graphs, but here we also see that it's performing comparably at the 99th percentile. So we're not losing any speed of answering requests. And we see that in terms of the total amount of what we can do with this server, we can actually do about 30% more. So with this specific application, just by moving, and of course, because we are now much more, um, I'd call it um, familiar and, and, and confident with our, with our Zing capabilities, we just replaced it over a night on all of our servers and just kicked out 90 servers. So I now have a spare of, you know, I have in my pool 90 servers that I can allocate to a different place. And that's 30% savings on this specific application just by moving them to Zing. So, so from a, a cost point of view, you, you figured that that was, um, that was an easy sell. <laughs> that was an extremely easy sell because looking at an application and looking at the server and looking at what we can do with it, our ability to provide services with a smaller IT put footprint, our ability to serve our clients faster, better, with less errors, all of that together is eventually revenue, A, on the lack of errors and better serving, that's revenue goes up. On the reduction of server footprint, that is revenue that I'm, or capital that I'm keeping home, and I'm not spending. So yes, there is some level of spend on the on the Azul licensing, but you put all of it together, it totally it fits, and there's a proven ROI for this project, and that's why we are continuing to deploy Zing wherever we just can. It actually is an extremely popular application, or or I'd call framework within Taboola, where it became a brand name with our developers. They are aware of it. it it's not me and IT that I need to push this out and say, oh, no, no, uh, new application, make sure that you're testing it on uh, the correct the correct uh, JVM, make sure that you're um, in production and you're zingified or however you would like to call it. You can just, it, it's just grass rooted and everyone wants it now. Right, I was gonna say, I imagine your CFO is very happy when he looks at the, the numbers for that kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. Good. Okay. Well, um, what we'll do then, I'll just just um, just to conclude the the webinar part of things, and just mention a few things around Zing. Obviously, um, we've heard the success story here, and and how uh, you've had some really quite impressive results that have uh, helped immensely in terms of um, the data footprint you've got and the yeah. um, number of machines and so on. And that's what we're really trying to do with Zing is to produce a low latency, high throughput JVM. And again, as you said, it's it's the simplicity of it being a drop-in replacement. You don't need to recode anything. You don't need to recompile. You don't even need to change your startup scripts. It's a very simple migration from using the old JVM to using Zing. And what we're really focusing on, especially with, with your type of application loads, is eliminating timeouts by eliminating the latency associated with garbage collection, uh, specifically making sure that your users meet their expectations, and also supporting bigger workloads on the same hardware, which as we've already explored, reduces the cost because you're reducing the provisioning costs and so on. And what I would say is if anybody's interested in this and trying it with their own applications, then you 
uh, we have a free 30 day trial for Zing. You can go to azul.com slash Zing trial. You can download it. We have engineers who can help you in terms of setting things up, making sure that everything's running the way that it should do, even though it is a drop in replacement. Obviously, one of the things that we like to help customers with is setting up the way of measuring the performance. And so we've got some nice tools that help people to understand exactly what the performance level is before using Zing and then using Zing with their application. And we can show the effects on latency um, for the JVM because it's quite important to do that because although obviously you're looking at application level, what are your users getting? It's also important to understand how is the effect in terms of the application interacting with the JVM. So we, we've got tools that we can help with that and produce some nice graphs, again, that you can show to your CFO and say, look, this is the, the results we get. This is why we need Zing. Um, so that, that's pretty much the end of the slides and the, the presentation part. So I guess what we'll do now is we'll see if anybody has any questions. Uh, so if we go to the, hopefully there'll be some questions. I can share okay. how we started out. Do you have any yep. questions or do you want me to share? Uh, no, if you share how you started out and then we'll see if anybody has any questions. Yes, happily. So um, this was over three years ago when we started out, we actually have a few, we had back then a few monolithic applications and we started with a one terabyte of, of heap uh, application. And that was a single server and, and it had this huge heap and that was our kind of first test where we had these 15 minutes cycle of, of garbage collection where the server would just stop responding for 15 uh, full minutes and would, would do the garbage collection, which is just the way Java works. And uh, we would accept that as long as, because this is a uh, backend application, it was our, our billing processing. And once we were able to optimize that and we suddenly saw that we're getting this flat, work there that was um one of the first kind of aha moments but i do want to say something about cassandra that i didn't have a chance to say earlier with zing we are able to do something amazing that is just unattainable unattainable without zing we reduced our node count and created extremely dense nodes over our hardware so we're using the same hardware but we are now able to put multiple terabytes of data on a single Cassandra node, which is usually not recommended, actually. If you go to the kind of best practices, you're supposed to do up to one terabyte, uh, up, yeah, up to one terabyte of physical storage per Cassandra node. But we're going way beyond that. And without Zing, that could not have been done due to latency, due to heap issues, due to uh, the actual ability of the server to answer quickly. So there were not only the ability to answer faster, but the ability to condense our cluster into more dense nodes. And now I see we have multiple hey, questions. I was going to say, so we've got some questions now. So the first question is, what GC algorithm were you using or were your applications using before you installed Zing? Do you know? I would assume you're probably yeah, using so G1. G1, exactly. Yeah. We're using uh, G1 and um, and again, this was four years ago, and uh, that was I th we we played around with a few others, but G1 was the only the only one that, in scale at least, uh, was was able to cope with what we were doing. And then we moved on into Zing once we saw the light. Right. Uh, second question: Could you talk about the efforts you spent on tuning the non-Zing JVM compared to the performance work you did since Zing? Uh, so that, that's kind of an interesting question. Did you spend a lot of time trying to performance tune the old JVM? So uh, this was this was years ago, and um, on the we did on the monolithic uh, application less on the front end servers. The front end servers we were going like, we don't have a problem. It's you know these small freeze it. You don't even mm. really grasp what's happening there uh, until you until you see. But yes, we tried uh, we tried different um different approaches we tried to reduce our heap size we tried to increase our heap size we tried to change our cache um our cache strategies we tried to do multiple different things in terms of how we can optimize our application and actually even since moving to zing we've been working with azul on our uh on our performance and continuously beyond the just default improvements we've been continuously seeing additional uh improvements on many fronts some of them around AVX 512, 
some of them around um, uh, CPU speed, some of them around uh, CPU pinning, some of them around NUMA, a lot of different uh, ways that, we, that we've been tweaking this around. But by far, the easiest and fastest and most, um, the word lucrative isn't, isn't correct here, but the most beneficial, I think that's the best word to use here for us in terms of cost performance was just, we move to Zing and we get all these benefits uh, behind it. It was so simple and allowed us to focus on uh, system optimizations, drive optimizations, um, application optimizations, and, and the rest that, that is the, the thing that made most sense for us. Sense for us. Okay. Um, and sort of related to that, what, um, the question is, what tools did you use to monitor Zing? Okay. So uh, our monitoring is based, what well, we, we don't monitor Zing directly. We monitor the whole, the whole system and there's a whole monitoring uh, framework in there. So the observability part is based on Grafana. The metrics are, uh, the database is Prometheus. It was a uh, metric tank back then. The um, log ship, the metric shipping was based, uh, is based now on, on Kafka. I'm, I'm trying to think what it was based back then. It was Sensu as the agent, as the local agent. There, there's a whole lot of different. There, there was not one tool that we used, but all the graphs you saw here are are Grafana graphs. The database now is, as I said, is the Prometheus uh, database, and we're pulling the the data with the with the local agent. So that's, um, I guess, the easiest and shortest answer I can give here. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out through LinkedIn, I can I can provide a much much longer answer. Okay. Um, another question here is, um, you spoke about latency flattening. Have you ultimately managed to reduce costs by migrate, migrating to Zing? Um, I think. Yes. Yeah, so I, I spoke about that uh, briefly, but I can I can elaborate uh, here a bit more. We we saw great cost savings um, just by in a, in a few places. First, our ability to reduce the server the, the server count in terms of the clusters. We reduce the size of the clusters. That's one. Then two, uh, we improved our our actual front-facing application. So if earlier, four years ago, we would be missing one percent or two percent of our requests, timing out or just working slower for the general user population, now we're answering much faster. And I think it's it's almost now a common knowledge that the faster you are online. The, the more chances you have of a user actually getting that piece of content on his device and actually having the ability to click on it. Because if you're too slow, the user just doesn't get to see you. Uh, so yes. it's, it's been improving our application, reducing our IT footprint, reducing our hosting costs, delaying the need for new hardware, all of those together uh, brought us to the, the, the relevant cost reductions and beyond. Yeah, so I think there's, there's two things to that, isn't there? There's obviously the, the ones you can easily look at, which is you can measure how many servers you saved, how much uh, you spent on the licenses. But then, uh, as you said, there's the, the cost or the uh, the benefit of being able to serve your customers quickly and therefore get more uh, business, if you like, through that. Um, yeah, there's another question here, which I think we answered or you answered at the beginning, which is how large is the estate? And I think you did say how many machines you have in your... Yeah, so we have 8,500 servers, that's 8,500 uh, servers. We actually have a bit more now, that's not a new slide. Uh, so we have a whole lot of servers. Um, not all of them are, are Java or Zing, but, all, but, but we're at thousands of, uh, of servers with Zing. Some of these servers are HDFS, for example. HDFS doesn't get as much um, benefit out of Zing, or we have other uh, technologies in Taboola, such as uh, Vertica, which again is not a Java-based, Java-based uh, application. So wherever we are Java, by now, I don't think there's a corner in Taboola where we, we have a Java application and we don't have uh, Zing beneath it, powering it up. Good, good to know, good to know. <laughs> right, um, and then I've got one more question, which is, um, we tune JVMs based on load. How did you have to tune uh, batch versus online for Zing? Um, does that make okay, well, sense? Okay, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. So we have our front end uh, applications, which is actually all the graphs I showed were for our front end applications. And I only spoke briefly at the end now about our batch processing with that 
big monolithic one terabyte uh, application that we started out with. So on front end applications, it's it's almost a no brainer. Um, you see, you have 20 servers or 60 servers or 100, in, in our case, hundreds of servers. If you're on AWS, of course, if you're on the cloud, then instances, but anyone with whatever their cost model is, and you can just reduce that footprint. So that's an easy, an easy way to look at it because you can do just more um, transactions per server, more transactions per second, or you have less errors, whatever the metric or the relevant metric for you is, if it's latency, sheer volume, uh, CPU load, whatever. On the backend applications, um, what actually was the, was the selling point for us is, this is actually, I mean, I'm smiling because I, I, I now, I, I'm recalling that feeling, I'll, I'll tell you about it. So we had this backend application, as I said, which was our billing application, and it would crunch all the data coming in. So we had this single server, it's now on Spark, it's now totally different with, uh, with a totally different technology. But back then, it was this big monolithic Java application. And we have all the billing data coming in, all the lines of logs coming in, and it would pick them up from the drive, and then crunch, 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 crunch them, and provide a status of, um, of where, the, where, where our system is today in terms of billing, and think that it had to crunch billions of lines of logs a day. Now, it would pause on, on, um, on GC every 15 minutes, and if there were, and just think of the boot time of this server, and think of the, if let's say you had a version on it that was problematic, and so you see the line going down, but then suddenly GC, oh, okay, now you're waiting, it's going up, you're waiting, waiting, uh, it finished at GC after 15 minutes, and then it's processing again, and you're trying to see, is it catching up or not? And I remember days on days, just looking at these graphs of the, the latency of this server, how much catch up time is it taking? And every time we had this big maintenance work, or we had to deploy on it, I mean, who remembers deployments anymore? We, we were now in continuous deployment, we're, we're not there, we, we don't live there anymore. But back then, this was a huge thing. Moving to Zing and this sudden flattening of the line, no more GC, no more hold the world. I want to just garbage collect now. And that kind of feeling of, ah, I can just see what the <laughs> server is doing continuously. No, this, this really, this feeling of relief. So I know that's not a number. I'm sorry it's not a number, but it was a single server. So. Luckily enough, when, when, we, when we did the licensing, uh, a single server is not a big deal in terms of licensing, and just for that feeling. I mean, it was just, it was, it was, the, um, it was the IT Administrator Appreciation Day last Friday. I mean, feel it for me, man, feel it for me, uh, whoever the question <laughs> came from. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, I'm always happy with happy customers, even if it is only one license. If it made your life much simpler, then that's better. Oh. Okay, um, that seems to be all the questions we have. Um, and so we're at about 40 minutes, so that's that's pretty good. So I think what we'll do is, um, oh, no, hang on. Um, uh, we're in the same boat now. Uh, it's challenging to convince the management on how much cost savings to bring to organizations. Thanks for sharing this information on working 24 seven. Um, great. So hopefully we've got another person there that's looking at Zing and, and we'll try use the trial and, and hopefully uh, get the same benefits that you've had from that. Um, so uh, just to wrap up, I would like to say that, um, as I said at the beginning, we have recorded this session and we'll be sending everybody a link to the recording so you can share it with family and friends. And um, we will also send you a copy of the slides. And I would say, like to say a very, very big thank you to you, Ariel, for uh, all of the information you shared with us. And um, and like I say, it's it's a happy customer is, is a happy Azul. <laughs> So with that, um, thank you to everybody for attending the webinar. Thank you for having me, Simon. Big love for me. Okay. Cheers.